the governor's challenge was met with a good degree of skepticism. And understandably enough, because in 2011, the average Texas public college and university charged over $27,000 for a four-year degree. So to call for $10,000 degrees appeared uh, to be uh, a very iffy proposition. And the Austin American Statesman published a story about the governor's speech in which the title of the, of the story really told uh, everything you needed to know about it. The title of the story was, Governor's Call for $10,000 Degrees Stumps Educators. Um, nevertheless, within a year after the governor offered his challenge, a number of universities answered that challenge and either developed or launched $10,000 degrees. It's our honor and pleasure to have two representatives from two of the schools that have really been pioneers with the $10,000 degree here today. So, with that said, by way of background, let me introduce our first speaker. Dr. Dan Jones is the president and CEO of Texas A&M University and Congress. He became president in July of 2008. Prior to that, he served as provost and vice president for academic affairs at Texas A&M International University in Laredo. Before entering the Texas A&M system, Dr. Jones served at the University of Houston downtown for 17 years. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jones. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to be with you here today. This is uh, it'd be really an honor to be able to share with you some of the great things that are happening at A&M Commerce. We're very proud of the work that we're doing on the uh, $10,000 degree. We're also just a little bit nervous and terrified about it, to tell you the truth. Not like the pressure is honest to produce, but uh, uh, this is a pretty complex undertaking, but we really have a lot of faith that we're going to produce uh, some revolutionary results. When the governor issued his challenge to come up with a $10,000 degree, um, it was correctly characterized as being met with skepticism. And in the interest of full disclosure, I would have to say that I was among the skeptics. Uh, and I can remember joking to my colleagues at the time that a college degree ought to be worth more than an eight-year-old Ford F-150. Um, <laughs> because uh, it, you know, it opened up the doors of the future and so forth. Um, and since we have launched on this venture, I have been accused by uh, other colleagues of mine of uh, selling my soul to the devil. So I can live with that, I suppose. Um, really, uh, the, the turning point of A&M Commerce came when I took this challenge to the faculty. And I said, this is you know, what uh, we have been challenged to do. Uh, is this something which you think we're up to? And uh, we have a group of very creative, very innovative, forward, uh, very forward-looking faculty. And they said, let's see what we can do. Let's see what we can come up with. I think that uh, the challenge is a real challenge. Uh, it's an important challenge. If we look at the fruits that have come to the nation from greater access and greater opportunity through, through education, uh, they are manifold. The, uh, the GI Bill is in many ways a turning point, not just for higher education in this country, but in the history of this country as well. Uh, we look at the, uh, the economic benefits that have come with opening the doors of higher education to more and more people. With the crisis of affordability that we are facing in higher education, we're going to have to meet this uh, issue of cost head on. Let me talk a little bit about our program. Uh, it has a lot of moving parts, and we are grateful. I want to acknowledge the efforts of Dr. Van Davis, uh, the coordinating board. I'll talk a little bit more about our partnership there in just a moment. But this is not the kind of a program that uh, we could get off the ground all by ourselves. Uh, it, it involves a lot of consultation with colleagues, a lot of creative brainstorming, uh, and a lot of experimentation. The, uh, the Texas Affordable Baccalaureate Program is the result at our university of a three-way partnership with the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board and South Texas College in DeKalb. And we were the fortunate recipients of an EDUCAUSE grant funded through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that essentially provided the seed money to help us develop uh, the curriculum and the assessment instruments and so forth, all the new resources that we're looking So it's a year-long process, and uh, we are at the front end of it now, but we're working hard. The, uh, the, uh, the uh, key ingredients here really boil down to three defining elements. One is 
competency-based instruction. And I'll talk a little bit more about each one of these in a moment. Secondly, this is a technology-enabled degree. It is not simply a technology-enhanced degree. Now, we all do online instruction. We all do hybrid uh, course delivery. We do a little online, a little face-to-face. -face. This program should not exist, is not possible without being technology-enabled. And finally, flat rate pricing. Essentially, the student pays one price per term that's all inclusive. It's about, you know, kind of like those Caribbean resorts where you just pay one big check up front. Although, in, in our case, it's not that big a check. So the student really is in control of the cost. And the student can move quickly through the program and keep the cost down. If the student moves more slowly through the program, then, of course, the cost will go up. But essentially, the cost is in the control of the consumer. All right, now let me unpack each one of those a little bit. Competency-based instruction. This is a very simple concept. Basically, the idea is that academic credit is awarded based on what you know and what you can do as opposed to how long you sit in the classroom. Uh, the traditional model, you know, our, our entire funding model, higher education in, in this state, really throughout the world, is based on the idea that uh, you sit in a classroom for 45 hours, which is what it is here in the state of Texas. Um, you, you expose yourself to instruction, and at the end of that time, you take the test and you either move on or you don't. Well, every student comes to the learning environment with a different set of skills and a different set of knowledge. So the idea is, if you come already knowing a lot of this stuff, you can move through pretty quickly. You don't have to sit in the seat uh, the entire 40, 45 hours. You take various assessment instruments. It's a very personalized degree plan. Uh, a lot of times when you think, uh, you know, you have a lot of technology stirred into the mix, that it becomes more uh, impersonal. But in this case, the technology allows a greater interaction between the academic coaches, the faculty members, the subject matter experts, and the students. Uh, there's weekly interaction to ensure that the student stays on the track. <clears throat> the competencies are defined by faculty experts. Uh, it's a very, uh, you know, there's a heavy dose of academic involvement in here. But in addition to the work the faculty experts do, there's a, a process called tuning. And uh, again, Dr. Davis is, is uh, much more the expert on this than I am. But the idea is that these competencies lead to something that the workforce demands. So the competencies are themselves the product of interaction between the academic world and the world of work. So that when students graduate, essentially they are certified as having the competencies, being able to demonstrate the learning outcomes that employers are looking for. So assessment of competence is critical to the academic integrity of the program. It's also one of the most complex pieces. You know, in a traditional classroom environment, assessment of competency is done by, you know, you write a term paper, you take a test, uh, you make a portfolio. Well, those are all valid assessment measures, but they are not necessarily good assessments of outcomes, actual skills, actual applied knowledge. So a lot of the work that we're doing this year is focused on developing you know, the myriad, really, the universe of assessment instruments that, that it takes to ensure the academic integrity of the program. Fortunately, you know, we're not starting from scratch here. Uh, a lot of this work has already been done. Uh, we're looking very closely at Western Governors University, which is uh, operating here in the state of Texas. This is, they, they adopt a competency-based model. So there, there's a lot of research and a lot of uh, best practices out there that we can go on. Okay, secondly, uh, technology enabled. Well, as I mentioned, technology is not just an enhancement or an add-on. Technology is, is baked into the program. Uh, technology provides the means of interaction between the student, the advisors, the mentors, the faculty members. Uh, really, there's an entire instructional team that is devoted to each student's progress. Uh, so it's, it's a very different kind of a model than you have in a traditional classroom environment where, you know, much like this, you got one person talking to a group of people. This really kind of reverses that, that paradigm. You have one student and a team of people who are monitoring the progress of that student, advising him or her of their progress and so forth. So, and the technology, again, is the key. Uh, it wouldn't work any other way. <clears throat> um, it's not just for the delivery of content. You know, in the, in the world that we live in today, uh, you don't have to pay, what is it, $27,000 to 
to go to the university to buy content. I mean, the content is out there. It's freely available. And Paul, I mean, uh, Paul probably heard of massive online open courses um, of a startup company that basically are providing all the content for free. If you've been to the Khan Academy online, uh, the knowledge is out there. You don't have to pay an instructor to teach you the stuff. But you do have to engage an academic institution in order to certify the competencies that you have acquired as a result of the process. And finally, uh, flat rate pricing. Um, the um, traditional, at least in the state of Texas, the traditional academic calendar is a uh, fall semester, spring semester, and then you know, you take a little extra stuff in the summer. Um, this is based on a series of six, seven week terms. So it's kind of a carousel model. Uh, a new term starts every six weeks, or every seven weeks, and you pay a flat rate of $683 per term, and it's all inclusive. So it's you get the instruction, you get the content, the coaching, the advising, the mentoring, as well as all of the instructional materials. So, uh, and they're all electronic. Um, one thing that uh, we're working on at A&M Commerce is the, the concept of shredded textbooks, and this is a way to keep instructional costs down. Uh, I'm sure that all of you at some point in your college career had to buy a book and you were only assigned to read one chapter and you felt a little ripped off as a result and you know probably still sitting on your bookshelf and every time you see it you get a little bit irritated. <laughs> the shredded textbook basically takes bits and pieces so that you buy only what you need. Now this has to be done in partnership with publishers. It's, it's not something that you know the university can just do on its own. So we're working with publishers to help develop that concept. Um, well, again, there, there's a lot more moving parts to it than that, but uh, that kind of gives a quick overview. Once again, it all comes back to access and opportunity. Uh, this is a way of extending the benefits of higher education to those who are in control of the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Our next speaker is Dr. Carolyn Wilson-Green. She's the Director for Information Technology and Cybersecurity at Texas A&M University in San Antonio. Dr. Green has worked for the past 10 years to help establish the university as a standalone institution. Prior to her current position, she served as the university's provost and vice president for academic affairs. Dr. Green is a 15-year veteran of the private sector as an information systems management consultant in the oil and gas and construction industries. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Green. Thank you. that we have 
uh, we have recognized that there is a great shortage of people coming out in information technology with uh, degrees in these areas, and particularly in security. And we've been trying to work uh, in partnership to, to meet those needs. Along with that, because we have a long-standing relationship with community colleges, we uh, have been talking a lot about this uh, challenge that we have an opportunity. We know that uh, we have young people in our communities who are really looking for jobs that have futures that would be challenging and interesting, and we think this is a great opportunity for them. And so through our conversations of having transfer degree programs that help their students from the very day that they come here their freshman year to see the path all the way through a bachelor's degree and to be able to work together with our, trans uh, our advisors and the community college advisors to uh, plan and carry out the degree program without taking courses that are not necessary, a duplication of work. Um, in those conversations, we began to think about how we would streamline it. And then as this challenge came about, it became a uh, sort of question we had. We, we began to wonder, well, just where are we in terms of the total cost? And I think for all of us, we had tended to look at our program in the scenes where we come together, but hadn't really looked at it in the whole picture and how it looks to the student. So the total cost for them is from the beginning to the end. In those conversations, I, I knew that there were opportunities with our relationship with, with the community college and their cost structure versus that of the university. But what I hadn't realized is how deep their relationships were with high schools. And so we began to talk about their programs in dual credit. They, one of the things that uh, we have in San Antonio is uh, the Information Technology and Security Academy, which is a high school program, and students from uh, high schools throughout the city are able to participate in this program, and they are trained in uh, information security. It's a technical field, but it's a very skilled and technical field, and it's one that has a significant uh, <coughs> opportunity for advancement beyond an associate's degree, not only beyond that, but into master's degrees and beyond. And um, so we saw that, and we saw the high school program. And then they began to share about what they were doing in dual credit with early college high school academies. From that, we, we sat down and we looked at them, and a way that students could take advantage of all those opportunities along that pipeline. So the degree program that we have laid out begins with early college high school into the uh, community college for the technical coursework necessary to have the foundation of network security, information technology, and the basic uh, foundations there, and then on to our program to complete the Bachelor of Applied Arts and Sciences. One of the questions we've been asked um, in the course of discussing this, and we've got a lot of press associated with it, uh, is about how we did it, and uh, whether or not we have made any um, adjustments in terms of who the faculty are who teach the classes in this program. Have we gone to adjunct faculty rather than our full-time faculty in order to achieve uh, efficiencies? And that's not the case. The classes that we offer uh, at the university are exactly the same ones that we offer our students in the Bachelor of Business Administration degree. Uh, same faculty, same classes, uh, exactly the same experience. At the community college, the courses are still exactly the same as what they had offered previously. The advantages come from uh, considering that whole path and looking at opportunities that students can take advantage of by planning early. So we're working now with um, not only the community college and getting the word out to students about this opportunity, but we're also now talking at the high school level. We have uh, meetings that are coming up soon to get to meet with students at one of the academies to talk to them about what this would mean if they have an interest in following this path. Um, we've been very pleased with, with the uh, response to it. I've had many calls from parents who have uh, come to visit, brought their prospective student to talk about it. Some of them are a little further along in the path, but many are just entering high school <coughs> and thinking about what they can do uh, to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, we've also looked at other degree programs that fit in the same role. We have other Bachelor of Applied Arts and Sciences concentrations. One of the ones that, that we're looking at right now is in uh, criminology. We know we have a good fit with criminal justice programs. We think there's an opportunity there. We know that there are uh, job openings in our area that would be uh, advantageous to our students. 
So we've been excited about it. I would say too that for us, it just really was a bottom-up activity. It came from faculty who worked together, uh, and so we know each other. We know each other's programs. Uh, we know the quality of the students that we get from the community college, and we feel like we've got a, a really good program. I'd also say, in terms of quality, um, our information technology and security program has been recognized now as a national center of excellence by the NSA and Department of Homeland Security. And so we're very pleased to be able to share that with our students as well. Um, we look forward to opportunities to find other ways that we can help our students in uh, achieving a really um, a valuable degree and uh, be able to do it in a way that is accessible to them and affordable. Um, the other thing I would, that I would mention is that um, we've been concerned about the cost of textbooks. And although the cost of textbooks has not been included in the $10,000 degree program as we've laid it out, the university several years ago, um, we got a grant, a uh, FIPSI grant, to, tr to try to do something about textbook costs. And in that grant, we, we went um, into a program to try to move into electronic textbooks. And we've done um, negotiations with a variety of publishers. And under this agreement, it's a, a university-wide multi-publisher uh, contract. The average cost of our textbooks is between $50 and $60 per text. And I know right now that the, one, the textbook that I would be using in one of my database classes would cost almost $200. My students have it for $50. So we have been able to bring those costs down. We didn't include that because it's variable enough that we didn't include it in the cost of the, the, the degree program, but we have been working in that area. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green. Our next speaker is Dr. Ann McGlashan. Dr. McGlashan is an associate professor and director of the Division of German and Russian at Baylor University. She's been at Baylor since 1990. Dr. McGlashan was recently elected the president the Texas chapter of the American Association of University Professors. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Flash. Well, thank you for the invitation to come speak to you today. I'm not here in any capacity as an expert on the concept of the $10,000 degree. I think you probably realize that. I could never presume to be one. But I would hope that I can bring a different perspective to the conversation. Many years ago, I was a first-generation college student, the daughter of two intelligent people who, due to circumstances beyond their control, had to leave school at age 14 to go to work to help their families. But I was lucky. My parents believed in education, even if they couldn't take part in it themselves, and I was able to attend a free public school that was one of the best in my country, Scotland, in case you were wondering, just because it was located in my hometown. I have experienced higher education in three different countries, as well as a lengthy stint in the workforce, clocking in from nine to five, so I also know what that's like. And I'm now a tenured faculty member at Baylor with 22 years of experience teaching undergraduates in both my own field of language studies, as well as the innovative interdisciplinary core there. It's been a fun, a weird ride. First, let me say that although many people will try to convince you that faculty members are dinosaurs, obstacles that have to be outmaneuvered if anything is to happen in higher education, it's not always the case. And it's especially not the case when it comes to trying to make higher ed uh, more accessible and especially more affordable. We are the ones on the front lines dealing with the students sleeping in class because they have worked all night. We are the ones who feel terrible when we have to assign that $200 textbook. Uh, because it's the only one on the market. We are the ones pleading with the bookstores every semester to stock last year's perfectly adequate edition so that there will be enough used copies to go around. And not always successful, I might add. Heck, we would buy the books from the students sometimes if we could. So we're all in this together, even although we might come at it from different perspectives. Having said that, however, I'd just like to put, put a few questions to you that I've been thinking about while doing my homework on Governor Perry's challenge to the Texas universities and on the different ways these universities are putting together an answer to that challenge. 
If I've understood correctly, uh, the challenge originated in the notion that higher ed should be more accessible to lower income students and less well prepared students, by which I mean both those students who may be extremely capable but either do not come from families who can help them financially or have attended schools that did not adequately equip them for going further with their education. However, several of the suggested $10,000 degree programs seem, pro seem problematic when looked at from the perspective of move moving students like these through higher education. No matter how interesting and innovative uh, they may be as course offerings for regular students and especially for non-traditional students, and I believe that they are very valuable. One of the most problematic issues to me, and the one I'd like to concentrate on today in the first part, is the emphasis on rigorous entry requirements, uh, especially the emphasis on taking dual credit during high school. Um, in order to be able to take enough dual credit courses, uh, a student would not only have to attend a school that offered such courses, or have the means of transportation to the local community college if necessary, but she would also have to turn on to the whole notion of higher education very early on, about 15, I would think would be the cutoff. In addition, she would have to continue with her chosen career until, uh, without deviation, since the one-year major at the university would leave really no room for change. This disturbs me as the child of an educational system that did not allow any room for change. I was pegged at age 15 as someone who was good at languages and so I was no longer allowed to do science. Now, I think now I would have made a pretty good doctor, and I would have enjoyed it too, but I never got the chance. One of the things that makes American higher education so vibrant and that you really do not want to lose is the ability to grow into one's competencies, to find the major that is right for you, even if it takes a couple of years. How many of you graduated with the same major as you signed up for as freshmen? Okay. Going back to our student in the $10,000 degree, she would finally have to be motivated and prepared, and let's face it, smart enough to be able to keep to a grueling schedule of completing 36 upper level major hours in one year, a feat that many of my students at Baylor, even those with the most supportive backgrounds, could not manage. For a truly motivated student who has matured early and who knows what she wants, I can definitely see the value in this. But would this really make college more affordable and accessible to those students who are not well prepared? Who have parents for whom college is a completely unknown quantity? Whose only access to online classes would be in a crowded public library? And who attend schools that can only dream of being able to afford to offer a dual credit and AP courses? As much as we want to believe that any student can complete such a rigorous course within four years, we have to admit that not all of them can, and many due to no fault of their own. Yet within these numbers of underprepared students are hiding so many who could become doctors, scientists, nonprofit leaders, and we still have to find a way to let less prepared students have what more prepared students already have, the ability to find their competencies and grow into their mental capacities, an ability that only comes with maturity and the possibility of choice. And that means reducing the cost for normal four-year degrees alongside the $10,000 degrees. So, how do we do that? I don't know. And I but I believe that an answer might be found by working together, both administrations and faculty members. And we have to start thinking outside the box. I've heard and read a lot of easy answers recently, and I hear them over and over again. And the main one is, just get rid of tenured professors like me and staff the university with cheaper adjuncts who will work for less pay. This will bring down costs. After all, the world is a different place now, and we don't need face-to-face -face education in brick and mortar institutions anymore. Now that university education can be unbundled, and any software company worth its salt can bring people together as they sit at home and read their e-textbooks online. Yes, I agree, the world is a different place today. And for many non-traditional students, we definitely have to be thinking of new ways of delivery. But I don't believe that the average 18-year-old has changed that much. I teach freshmen and I teach seniors, and sometimes the same ones four years later. The difference that four years of challenge make, uh, brings to these students can be phenomenal. And it doesn't matter by then whether a student was prepared or unprepared, they can both succeed. 
A colleague of mine teaches a course in Middle East Studies, and last week, after the tragic loss of the American ambassador, he set up a scenario where he split the class into several groups. Advisors to Governor Romney, advisors to President Obama, advisors to the Muslim Brotherhood, and State Department employees. The interaction, and I heard this from the students, was electric, and each came out with a better perspective on the other's problems. That's what face-to-face -face education can do. Nor do I think that American businesses have changed that much. Even if these students never go into diplomacy, they will be invaluable assets to a boss with business problems to solve. But couldn't we do this kind of education with adjuncts? People who would teach one class a semester for about $3,000 a pop? Ask the students, who's going to be there to advise them? Who's going to write the recommendation for them for medical school? to help them get internships, to listen to them when they get depressed, and yes, we do that more than you'd like to think. Who would be there who knows them and knows their potential? And I would ask another question. In a world where higher education classes are taught class by class by people who cannot make enough to feed their families, who have no health benefits, no job security, no way to pay back their own student loans, are the best and brightest going to go into higher ed teaching? In a generation or two, who is going to be teaching your grandchildren? So, with, let's talk about $10,000 degrees alongside reducing costs for traditional four-year degrees. And let's start getting together to hash out how we're going to continue educating our children, not just for a job, but for life. And that includes our underprepared children. Let's put everything on the table and not just the easy targets. Let's talk bureaucracy student life, whether or not we should reduce the emphasis on research and put more experienced faculty back in the classroom. But at the same time, let's talk about putting the brakes on the veneration of the top tier position in US News and World Report, uh, the holy grail of academia. And let's talk, dare I say it, athletics. Let's put everything on the table. Let's lay competitiveness aside for a while and think outside the box and ask your faculty to help, because we're willing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Russian. Last, but by no means least, we have Dr. Raymond Paredes with us. Dr. Paredes is the commissioner of the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. He spent most of his academic career at UCLA, where he taught as an English professor, as vice chancellor for academic development, and as special assistant to the president of the University of California system. Prior to joining the coordinating board here in Texas, Dr. Predes was director of creativity and culture at the Rockefeller Foundation, and then vice president for programs at the Hispanic Scholarship Fund. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Predes. Contents for this $10,000 baccalaureate degree, and also talk about uh, some of the uh, some of the issues related to the uh, $10,000 baccalaureate in the context of larger issues in higher education. First of all, here's some facts that uh, that are that are urgently in need of attention. The cost of higher education has been going up dramatically in Texas uh, for uh, the past 20 years. Uh, what is happening in Texas, what has happened in Texas, follows a national pattern. Uh, since uh, the tuition was deregulated in 2003, uh, the, uh, the academic costs, educational costs of students have gone up as much as 90%. Uh, the cost of uh, community colleges has been going up significantly as well, although community colleges in Texas are still a bargain compared to costs around the country. I think I saw a study that we developed recently that showed that we were third or fourth in the country in, uh, in terms of the cost of attending a community college in Texas. Um, we are in a situation where we are still severely under-competitive uh, compared to other states in terms of educational attainment. 
Uh, we are eighth among the 10 largest states in terms of higher education participation, and I'm talking about both community colleges and universities. And uh, there have been a lot of studies, some that have been done by the, the Texas Business Leadership Council, for example, to demonstrate that Texas will not be competitive um, either nationally or internationally unless we dramatically improve higher education attainment in this state. These trends in terms of overall cost are occurring at the very same time that we see a counter trend in public education. 60% of the students in the public K-12 system in Texas are defined as being poor. So you can see that the model that's currently in place is simply unsustainable. Costs going up dramatically, the ability of students to pay going down significantly. That 60% figure, which comes from the Texas Education Agency, will only go up. So unless we find a way to lower the costs of higher education, we are going to see a decrease in higher education attainment in Texas. And we're all, as I pointed out a moment ago, relatively low in terms of attainment compared to other states. Let, let me talk about uh, some of the misperceptions of, of uh, about the $10,000 degree. First of all, we're not talking about all institutions, we're not talking about all programs, and we're not talking about all students. I, I think it is unlikely that the University of Texas at Austin will be working on $10,000 baccalaureates in the these will, be, uh, these will be programs that will be available, available, one hopes, in every part of the state, available to students for whom this sort of pathway is the best opportunity for a higher education credential. I don't imagine that uh, we're going to create a lot of uh, $10,000 baccalaureates in fields like engineering and the basic sciences because they require, at least with the current technology, an awful lot of laboratory time and an awful lot of face-to-face -face, uh, instruction. I suspect that uh, there will always be, or at least for the foreseeable future, there will be the kinds of traditional students that you just heard about who will flourish in an atmosphere where they attend a residential college, they have a lot of face-to-face -face instruction, and the experience of going to college is not only an intellectual one, but also one that involves emotional, psychological, social growth. So we're talking about making sure in Texas that we have a pathway to a higher education credential for students from every background in every circumstance. That's what we're talking about. We are uh, in uh, the, the uh, program that's being developed at uh, Commerce and South Texas College that you heard President Jones talk about a moment ago. Uh, we focused on one particular discipline. We're going to offer baccalaureate organizational leadership. It's a general studies degree which provides students broad liberal education as well as very specific skills in job related fields. We want this to be a degree that makes students work ready as soon as they are awarded their baccalaureate degree. We are going to monitor the quality of these programs. We are going to make sure that uh, students are uh, well instructed, we want to make sure that they're workforce ready, and we want to make sure that at the end of compl the completion of this program, that we can demonstrate and document rigorous learning outcomes. I suspect that this will be a program that doesn't appeal to students that are coming out straight out of high school. I suspect that it will appeal to students who've been in the workforce for four or five years, perhaps longer, have determined that they're not competitive to achieve the kind of salary that they would like to support themselves and their families and are looking for a well-paced program that appeals to students who are relatively mature, have job experience, and are eager to create a circumstance for themselves so they can provide for their families. 
I believe very strongly that this kind of program will be absolutely critical to our array of higher educational options in Texas. I would also like to point out that this $10,000 baccalaureate is simply one of the things that we are going to do in Texas and that will be done around the country to respond to the growing crisis in higher education. This crisis is manifest all over the country. Last week's Newsweek magazine featured a cover article on whether higher education was, worse, or was worth the expense and the investment. And the conclusion was, unless you pick the right institution and the right discipline to major in, it's probably not. And there are more and more people who believe that. Uh, you all know about the controversy at the University of Virginia, which laid bare, it seems to me, the, 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 uh, the uh, essentials of the controversy that we're having nationally. Whether higher education can simply respond to the changing demands for education, both in Virginia and around the country incrementally, or whether we need to embrace what Clayton Christensen is called disruptive innovation. I'm someone who believes more in disruptive innovation than incremental change. I think that, uh, that the $10,000 degree will be considered, or the controversy over a $10,000 degree will be considered laughable in 10 or 15 years. What will happen well before then, but be, will be well established by then, will be the emergence of institutions. They might be for-profit companies. They might be offshoots of established institutions of higher education, where these entities will bundle <coughs> open course software, free courses, along with some online <coughs> courses that students have to pay for, they will create end of course exams for every one of these courses that are offered either free or for a nominal, nominal fee, and they will award degrees for the completion of those programs. And I've talked to individuals who think that can be done for three, four, five thousand dollars and produce high quality higher education credentials. We're going to uh, see a more self-paced instruction and in learning. There's absolutely no research anywhere that demonstrates that it takes everybody 15 weeks to master a body of knowledge. So for those students who want to move at a quicker pace and have done a lot of learning and reading on their own, We'll have competency-based instruction, more competency-based instruction learning so that students can complete degrees in very short periods of time. We'll see more uh, credit given for life experience. You see it now in Texas, the uh, college credit program for returning uh, uh, war heroes. We're going to see more, uh, uh, more courses that involve actual job experience, paid internships that involve academic credit. All those things are coming. And so that I think one of the things that will happen within the next five to 10 years is we'll, we'll say, why did we ever, ever think that college degree should cost as much as $10,000? And unless all of higher education responds to those kinds of changes, those kinds of, fun, of, of fundamental ideas about what higher education is, as well as responding to the fundamental changes in technology that are available to students. If we don't respond to those changes, we'll see institutions being left behind, and we'll see the concentration of, uh, of education and relatively few institutions that are much more adept in responding to the changing needs of American students. Thank you very much. further in a, in a research study that uh, the Texas Public Policy just uh, 
just completed and that you'll be able to uh, get on your way out uh, at the elevator. I did a research study on the $10,000 degree and I call it anatomy of a revolution question mark. And uh, the points that I try to make in it are this. Picking up from the governor's challenge in February of 2011, at first there was, as, as I mentioned, a good degree of skepticism and understandably enough that this could be done. And then when schools such as uh, uh, those that we've, uh, uh, from whom we've heard presentations actually came up with such degrees, the next response, um, that didn't stop the criticism. The criticism then became, it, it, took, it took a number of fronts, uh, all valid concerns. One, that, that the universities were offering $10,000 degrees, but they hadn't really reduced their costs to $10,000. They had simply moved uh, uh, costs around. Um, and also that, also another criticism was that this could not answer the scalability uh, uh, request of the governor. The governor, in, in, an, in an appendix to his uh, initial request for a $10,000 degree, said he wanted this to be available to 10% of Texas public college and university students. And the argument was that even those programs which had done this pioneering work, such as uh, uh, two that we have here uh, today, that this was not replicable. Um, by my lights, uh, uh, this criticism may miss the larger point. And that's this. Up until now, debate over how best to address the college affordability crisis has led to calls to action on two fronts. First, calls to lower student, the interest rates on student loans so that students could pay more. And or, second, asking taxpayers to pay more through, through increasing state subsidies to higher education. But the $10,000 degree stands as a new model and as a challenge. For the first time, the college affordability crisis is being approached through focusing on how the institutions themselves can lower the costs for students, their parents, and taxpayers. And this shift in the debate is, in my view, the first sense in which the $10,000 degree is revolutionary. The second sense, and I think this is the deeper sense in which it could be called revolutionary, is in the social psychological sense. And by that I mean this. The very existence of $10,000 degrees appears very likely to spark what we call a revolution of rising expectations on the part of students and then on the part of parents. Why do I think that? Well, a recent national study done by Pew shows that 75% of prospective students today think college is unaffordable. 57% think that college does not deliver good value for the cost. Um, the critics, a number of the critics of $10,000 degrees after they were announced said, well, $10,000, you get what you pay for. I wish that were the case. Certainly, the surveys of parents and, persp and prospective students shows that today, strong majorities do not believe that you get what you pay for from higher education as currently constituted. If they did, then the appeal of the $10,000 degrees wouldn't be what it is. I mean, let's just look at the facts here. In the last 25 years, tuition across the country has risen 440%. That's more than three times the rate of inflation. That's more than twice the rate of increase in health care costs. To keep up with these skyrocketing tuitions, student loan debt has followed the same upward arc. Student loan debt today is at roughly $1 trillion. For the first time in history, student loan debt is higher than total national credit card debt. It's been said that that which is unsustainable won't be sustained. We are at that point. The question is what to do about it. Therefore, it seems to me that in light of consumer sentiment and the view that no, you don't get what you pay for anymore in higher education, it seems to me that the $10,000 degree can't help but to spark the demand among parents, students, and taxpayers for more $10,000 degrees, not just at a few Texas public colleges and universities, but at every Texas public college and university, and, and where feasible, in every field where it can be offered. And that's 
what I mean when I say that I think that the criticisms of the fledgling $10,000 degree programs missed the larger point. And the larger point is that the ground has shifted forever beneath the feet <coughs> of traditional higher education. Having said that, I'm happy to open the floor uh, to questions. Um, let me and let me start off by uh, listening to everyone. I wanted to get to the opinion of the four speakers uh, on the following question. And that is, going forward, what do you think are going to be the greatest challenges to the $10,000 degree? And I mean challenges not only in terms of the feasibility of achieving the scale that the governor uh, announced, but also challenges with regard to maintaining the quality, which must always be first and foremost in our mind when we talk about higher education. Well, I, I think uh, the uh, biggest challenge is simply the uh, resistance of uh, of uh, higher education uh, to uh, change. And I'm not singling out higher education, I'm simply uh, pointing out that there's a lot of research that shows that uh, well-established institutions that have a long history of success are difficult to transform. Um, and what, what I fear will happen is that, uh, is that the transformation of, uh, of public higher education in this country and uh, conventional Private higher education will lag behind uh, technological innovation. And uh, as I said, there are an awful lot of companies out there that are doing some pretty extraordinary things in delivering higher education content. And I fear that there might be a migration of uh, students to those kinds of uh, delivery methods for higher education. And the conventional uh, institution of higher education, whether it's a two or four year institution, whether it's a public or private institution will find themselves uh, struggling for survival. I want to preserve the Baylors, uh, the, the UT Austins, uh, the residential universities of the world uh, for certain kinds of students. But I worry that if they don't respond to change quickly enough, that uh, they'll be uh, uh, they'll be put out of uh, put out of business. Yeah, I, let me follow on that. This is kind of an extension of the same sentiment, and it has to do with the role of the faculty going forward. The faculty are critical to the success of any academic program offered by any university. And I think uh, you heard Dr. McClashman uh, articulate some of the concerns of some of the faculty. Uh, and I hear this all the time, that the idea is that uh, we we seem to be going in a direction in which knowledge is, is, uh, is commodified and becomes devoid of faculty. Uh, that basically, the faculty are no longer involved in the instructional process uh, and therefore are no longer valued members of the academic community. And I think that, they, uh, that that's not an irrational fear on their part. Um, I think there are ways of managing that. I think there are ways of involving them in the process. But that's where, um, that's where leadership has to play a critical role. We have to ensure that the faculty are along for the ride um, in, in this reform and reinvention process. Otherwise, um, the knowledge itself will become kind of a dead and lifeless thing. It'll just become something that exists on CDs and, and you can log on to and get on the internet. The faculty involvement is still critical to both the instructional process as well as the integrity of the academic community. not only for you know, the, the uh, ability to go forward, but to think about um, the balance between what you can do in um, online education that is not interactive versus what happens in discussion uh, in going deeper. I can't speak to it in all, in all uh, subject areas, but I can in my own. And uh, information technology is as technological as it is, it is a rapidly changing field. And uh, our students do need to master a number of things, like knowing <coughs> different operating systems and network protocols. And it's very technical. But um, 
they're foundations of, of concepts and ways of thinking that are really crucial to being effective if you're going to have a career in information technology. Learning to think about things as systems to, to question and to uh, look at problems in a different way requires discussion. And I, I find in, in the classroom, although we'll have the technical part that students get quite often with their reading and then they come to the come to class, that interaction with it and the things that students ask and the deepening of their understanding comes in that, that discussion. And so I, my own question is how to preserve those things as we move forward in making education even more accessible to students, to be able to have the best of both. And finding that balance, I think, is going to be a challenge for faculty, as well as our administration's understanding exactly you know, how we ought to go forward to best serve our students. Well, having taken my daughter around many institutions in Texas and uh, outside of Texas, I would say maybe one of the obstacles is definitely the expectations that students have of a university. And these expectations are growing. Um, is our dorm better than the dorm at, at the university down the road? Um, do we do we have do we have to share a room? Do we have to share a bathroom? Uh, can we have a climbing wall in, in the in the, uh, the the gym gymnasium? Um, when we get to the point where we've got ten thousand dollar degrees taking uh, a lot of the monies away from the university, uh, something's going to have to give. And um, are we willing then to allow our universities um, to go down in the expectation in, in, in the expectation that students have for them? I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I think sometimes students have too big expectations for their dorm room and their bathrooms and everything else. But uh, I do think it's something that we need to think about. Uh, I was reading about UT uh, Permian Basin who are doing uh, the four-year degree um, there. And I was interested in reading that um, they can, they're doing it at the moment as an add-on because they have extra room that they can add this $10,000 degree. But uh, I'm, I can't tell you who said this, but someone said in the article I was reading, uh, we will have to rethink it once our capacity comes up to, to a certain level. Um, yeah, we're, it, it's a competitive world out there. And um, I think that's going to have to be balanced. Uh, just to follow up on that, I, I, I think that's right, which you refer to, we call the uh, academic amenities arms race. And I mean, I, I know that my wife and I, when we took uh, our son to college his freshman year, that the uh, dorm into which he moved was better than the apartment in which we moved when we were married. Um, you know, it's a longer discussion, but what has made that possible has been the up till now open spigot of federally subsidized dollars, uh, which cannot help but to incentivize institutions to raise tuitions accordingly. And then when you have students with all of this money, which at 18 seems to be available for free, uh, that produces a greater demand and then in turn, uh, universities want to compete with these to show that in fact, they'll not only get a good education, but we also have a state of the art wellness spot. And uh, I think that that's been part of the reason for the ratcheting up. And I agree with you that that's, that that's going to have to stop. And as far as the concern about faculty being seen as opponents of change, I would say quite the contrary. I mean, I mean we here at TBPF recognize that 40 years ago, faculty outnumbered administrators at American universities, and rightly so. Today, administrators outnumber faculty. So the increase in tuition has not come in a, in a form that it, that has led uh, to professors getting living off the fat of the land. That's, that hasn't been happening. Uh, instead, it's been administrative bloat. Uh, it's true in Texas, and it's true across the country. And, it's, and addressing that is going to be, have to be part of a comprehensive solution to the problem of college affordability. Having said that, let's open up the uh, floor here uh, to uh, questions. Yes. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for your presentations. They were quite enjoyable. My name is Samia al -Badri. I come to you as a professor and as a parent. Let me start with being a parent first. My daughter took an online course. And she came from a very rigorous uh, high school. The course had... Um, 
interaction with the faculty, but she hated it. She absolutely hated it. She refused to take another course within that area of study because all she did was figure out what they wanted, regurgitated it, and that was it. I found that to be not only scary for not only my child, but the next generation, that they regurgitate as opposed to process think. To being a professor, not everyone belongs in a four-year academic institution. Three quarters of my classes, my freshman classes, they not only do they not know why they're there, but an applied degree, where appropriate, would work just fine for them. And I think your $10,000 applied degree would be just great. Part of my job as a professor is to tease out a student's thinking seeds. I spend an awful lot of time training kids to think, not to regurgitate. Frankly, that information can be found anywhere. I am really concerned when you say, and I don't remember who said this, that you know, this program is going to be the next phase of academia. That scares me. I look at Oxford. I look at universities that really have thinkers rather than the Walmart of education where it's everybody and anybody and you can get a degree and what the heck are you going to do with it. I think that's very frightening. And I think before I buy into the idea of let's make it affordable to everybody, Let's talk about the quality. Let's talk about what it is that we're really teaching. You know, if we're teaching the, the, an applied field, I will so heartily agree with that concept and say, let's go for it. Because the majority of our kids do not need to be the thinkers at Oxford or MIT or Yale or wherever else. They like doing other things. They are better at it. And let's work on that part, how to promote those kids' expertise and their yearnings, as opposed to talking about negating the faculty or allowing online teaching for the universe. I don't know that that's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone like to comment? I don't, I don't recall anybody saying that these kinds of programs would displace all of higher education. I, I know I said that it was just going to be one more pathway to make higher education accessible to a larger uh, number of students. Um, uh, your daughter uh, did enjoy a, an online course. Maybe it was a lousy course. Maybe the professor had offered the course would have been lousy face to face. Um, uh, there, we, we know that uh, there are certain kinds of students that enjoy online courses better and they do regular face-to-face -face courses. And we know that there are certain kinds of students who don't do well in online courses at all. So we, we can take that into account. Um, there, there, there's, no, you know, there's no evidence that the only way you can become a, 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 a well-rounded, uh, highly thoughtful student is through face-to-face -face interaction. There, there are plenty of examples of high uh, <coughs> who develop those abilities without uh, any formal education. Uh, the technology is, is, uh, is developing that allows uh, virtual communities to exist, but presumably uh, you can develop a lot of those characteristics. Um, my, my attitude is we shouldn't foreclose on anything. I'm not sure that uh, um, as I indicated, I think for the foreseeable future, there will be an awful lot of students that are interested in conventional, residential, university experience. But there are an awful lot of students who can't 
uh, take advantage of such opportunities and who would prefer other other uh, other ways of, uh, of getting a higher education credential anyway. So I think we just need to make sure that uh, we recognize that uh, the population of potential students is incredibly diverse and we need to make sure we create pathways for students from all backgrounds. Let me just add a quick, um, footnote note to that. As, as part of our development process uh, in terms of implementing a $10,000 degree, we put together a list of characteristics of students who are likely to be successful in this kind of a program. And here's the list. Self-motivated, group-oriented, workplace or life experiences, training opportunities through employment, military or other source, access to the internet, and access to social media. And I would amplify that and say, adept at social media and very comfortable in an online environment. So clearly I'm not describing the universe of college students here. You know, I'm describing a group of people who are well positioned to take advantage of a new opportunity in higher education. Um, none of these things would have applied to me when I was 18, by the way. <laughs> Certainly not social media. <laughs> Um, your concern about quality, I think, is rightly taken. Higher education is just that, education. And no matter how low we cut the price, if we're shortchanging students on education quality, we have defeated our own purpose. We're not being fair to them or to our society. <coughs> Having said that, you know, this is sort of the other side of the you get what you pay for critique of the $10,000 degree. And when surveys show that families and, and uh, students think that no, you don't get what you pay for. It's not simply the cost, because cost is always relative to the value that you're getting. Um, the landmark national study published last year by the University of Chicago <coughs> Press, Academically Adrift, showed that after four full years of college, 36% of students across the country show little <coughs> to no increase in critical thinking, complex reasoning, computational and writing skills after four full years of college. So while I agree with the sentiment behind the critique that you get what you pay for and a $10,000 degree will sacrifice quality, I would reframe the concern. I would say, how can we continue to expand $10,000 degrees without exacerbating the already existing crisis in student learning that exists in traditional higher education today. And that's another part of the reason for the appeal of $10,000 degrees. Because parents, they may not be academics, but they can tell that something's happened over the last 40 to 50 years in higher education in this country. Academically Adrift quantifies it. Alan Bloom, 25 years ago, predicted it in the closing of the American mind. So the popularity of the $10,000 degrees really amounts to this. Families and prospective students are saying, you no longer teach us about the good life because postmodern relativism is destroying our belief that we can know that. You no longer teach us how to be democratic citizens. Department of Education statistics show that most universities today don't even require one course in American government. So if you're not going to teach us about the good life or about how to be a good citizen, which universities traditionally did up until 40 years ago, then you might as well teach us how to get a job. And oh, by the way, for that stripped down education that you're already providing, we'll give you $10,000. That's what the market is saying to higher education today. And that's why this initiative has taken on the momentum that it has. Yes. Um, yeah, you do get what you pay for, but Texas also gets what it pays for. And um, we've got to think about the fact that if Texas wants to be uh, competitive in American higher education, um, the, the, uh, the place of research in the university is going to have to be addressed. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when, you, when you're talking about the, the failure of uh, faculty to teach, to somehow bring on 36% of the, of the student population. Um, why might that be? Where might the faculty actually be? Mm -hmm. 
and they are, are, are they're chasing the research dollars, and they're chasing the research dollars so that uh, universities like Texas A&M uh, and uh, UT can move into the top 50. Because if they don't move into the top 50 in US News and World Report, Texas lags behind, and uh, the, com the competition is lost. So I think it's a much, much bigger problem than simply um, that we're not educating 36% of the student population. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, faculty are only responding to the incentives provided for them by the institutions. And it just shows the depth of the crisis in higher education. Because what you're talking about, and, you're, and it's rightly so, we have to rethink the whole method by which we rank universities today. Today we're ranking only on inputs, and they should instead be on outputs. And the primary output should be, what have students actually learned from the freshman and senior year? Other questions? Uh, Joe Jordan. Um, first off, I should say I'm not an academic. I don't uh, I have worked in the industry, but I have spent a lot of time on the high tech side selling to institutions of higher education as well as, uh, as high schools, uh, trying to provide the tools that are necessary to, to do some of what you do so well. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed just in the last uh, 10, 15 years, I guess there's a big change since we were in school, uh, and I graduated in 1979 uh, from high school, is the uh, money and attention that's gone into the career technology education field in the high schools particularly. And I think it's a great move because I do agree with uh, folks have promoted that, both at the state and the federal level, that a lot of kids um, uh, are not destined for four-year degrees and don't need it, but they can be very productive citizens uh, if they're focused early in the career that they're interested in. What I have found, though, is in working with uh, providing tools to particularly the CTE teachers in the high schools, uh, there seems to be a very, very poor coordination between the CTE programs as they're set up and defined and the uh, degrees, the even two-year academic degrees could be provided at the even the community uh, college level uh, and feeding those kids into those programs. Uh, I've heard frustration on both sides, both at the high school CTE director levels, uh, counselors who are working with those kids, and also from the uh, from the those in the higher education areas that are getting those kids in. Uh, it seems to be we should be focusing on how to coordinate those degree programs so that it e is easy to feed those kids into uh, a two-year institutional program is going to complete the degree that they started the first two or three years in high school. Could you make a comment, I guess, from your institution's perspective um, if that's an issue for you that you recognize and how you're addressing it? I know this is something that Commissioner Freddie's been working on for some time. Would you like to comment? So the, the, uh, the issue is, is not CTE in high school and, and uh, CTE in community college. The same thing applies to academic programs. There, there's not effective communication between K-12 sector and higher education in Texas or anywhere else in the country. Uh, they, I, I cite a, a study that was done about five or six years ago. <coughs> I, th I think it was a study done by, uh, a survey done by Education Week magazine. And it asked a very simple question. It asked college and university faculty how well their students had been prepared to do college level work in high school. And they asked the same question to high school teachers, how well do you prepare students to do higher education work? The response from high school teachers was close to 80% said they did either a good or excellent job of getting their students ready for college. And the response from university and college faculty was about 20% thought the high schools did a good job. It, it's, it's, it's across all of pathways to post-secondary opportunity. Workforce people tell you neither high schools nor colleges nor universities do as well as they would like in preparing uh, students to go into the workforce. So we have problems in communication across the landscape. We need to get K-12 and higher education working together much more effectively than we currently. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Please join me in, in, in thanking our speakers. <laughs>